Mark Shaw is here with us again, and we're talking about his research and his book that came out of that, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, the reporter who knew too much. Mark, you say that there is a key suspect that you informed the police about, and you've even talked to him, and his name was Ron Pataki. Can you give us any details about him and why you feel he is the chief suspect? Well, long ago, there was the uh, what they called the, the mysterious man who met Dorothy Kilgallen on the last night of her life. She died uh, on November 8, 1965. Uh, the death uh, happened during the night, but before that, we could trace what Dorothy Kilgallen was doing. Now, people may remember her as the great reporter and all of that, but she was also on What's My Line, the right. uh, intellectual television show, as I say. Uh, if you look at that last show of hers, you would see Dorothy uh, as vibrant and as, as smart as she always was. Right. Uh, she guessed uh, a, a uh, occupation by one woman who sold dynamite, and that will come into play answering your question. So Dorothy, after that show, and I believe it was 10 to 11 at that time, or 10 to 10.30, whatever it was, she ended up at a watering hole called P.J. Clark's in New York City that's still there. I sat right where next to where she was that last night. Uh -huh. Then we know that she went to the Regency Hotel, uh, which was on uh, not about oh, four or five blocks from her home on East 86th Street. And there, that particular woman, uh, Catherine Stone, who was on What's My Line, they had a little gathering of the people on the show with Dorothy. And she was really interested in meeting Dorothy because Dorothy had guessed her occupations and everything. So uh, she noticed Dorothy over in a booth in a dark corner talking to a man. Uh, and she couldn't, rec you know, she didn't recognize the man. Uh, she could describe them a bit, but she couldn't recognize them, but she saw them. And what she really said was there's a very serious conversation going on. They were not laughing. They were drinking, but they were not laughing. It was very serious. Well, one way or another then, Kilgallen left that uh, Regency Hotel bar. Uh, we have some information of a phone call she made to the, her newspaper about her column and everything. But the next thing that we know is that she was at her townhouse, and that's where she died. And uh, we, we know that uh, her death was not discovered. It was a mix-up in terms of when it was discovered. But first of all, about 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, or a little before that, the butler found her in the bathroom. And then about an hour later or so, Ron, uh, excuse me, uh, Mark Sinclair, her hairdresser, found her uh, in this bedroom where there was obviously a death scene, a stage death scene and all of that. Mm -hmm. so the question had always been, who was this particular mystery man that met, met uh, Dorothy Kilgallen at the Regency Hotel bar. So my research started there and I started to look into who this was, who this guy was and who had come into Kilgallen's life prior to uh, you know, when she died in November uh, of 1965. I learned that a man named Ron Pataki, who was a journalist in Columbus, Ohio, uh, entertainment columnist, a real hunk who had a bit of a violent background and all of that and, and was in trouble with money and things like that, uh, had come into Kilgallen's life what looked like kind of conveniently uh, about six, uh, well, a few, uh, let's see, just after the Jack Ruby trial that Kilgallen covered. And, and they met on a European junket when they were over there doing promotion, Dorothy was, uh, with her column for um, The Music Man, I believe it was. Anyway, so Pataki came into her life. He was 22 years younger than she was, but she fell for him. She had an estranged marriage, and she fell for him. So then Pataki basically kind of became her, the man in her life. Um, and so I looked at that relationship and started to kind of peel the onion a bit, uh, Larry, as to how he could have possibly been involved in Kilgallen's death. That's where we start. Now... No, he, 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 he came into her life, uh, you, you said, uh, with convenient timing. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, she wasn't sharing her information that she had discovered about the JFK assassination with anybody at that particular time. Mark Lane, who was a, 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 an author and all of that, was her friend, but she didn't even share a lot with him. Dorothy kept everything pretty close uh, to the vest. 
She was writing a book for Random House. It was going to name names that Hoover had covered up everything about the assassination, that Carlos Marcelo, this New Orleans Don, was the guy who orchestrated it. She had all of this evidence in a file that she had. And she started writing these columns and everything, uh, both before and after the Ruby trial. But Pataki, uh, basically, I found out, was really a pathological liar. He would tell me things like, uh, no, she never shared any of the information she had about Jack Ruby or that she was going to uh, do work on the book. And then the next interview I, I had with him, he said, oh, yes, I remember talking to her about a headline and some of the substance of, a, of an article. So I kept being really suspicious of exactly what was going on there. And it just seemed to me like he came along at a very convenient time. And I think that'll fit in with what we'll talk about a little bit later. So what happens? Well, between the time the uh, Ruby trial was over, which is going to be about uh, April of 64 and through 65, Dorothy is continuing to do her investigation. Uh, she's continuing to make notes in this file for her book for Random House. She's writing a some of the material for that. And she and Pataki become very close. He visit, she visited him in Columbus. Uh, he told me at one point they weren't lovers, uh, but the evidence points the other way for sure. And so she trusted him with what was going on in the investigation. Well, it's interesting because as we move forward, um, I kept finding uh, little bits of information. You know, Dorothy was very, she's an investigative reporter, a lot like you are, Larry. You look for little things that mean a lot. You're a curious person. That's how Dorothy Kilgallen was. She covered many of the major trials. She was always looking for things that didn't make sense. Well, what she, what she figured out is that Jack Ruby was to be the focus of her investigation and everything. And she was writing these columns and all of that. But it concerned her with regard to what really happened in Dallas, because JFK was her friend. And so she, she just kept uh, working on this mountains of, mountain of evidence, and she trusted Pataki with a great deal of it. Yeah. So as we get to November 1965, she made a huge, huge mistake. And it's the same mistake that I'm going to compare with the death of Marilyn Monroe in 1965 in a new book, in 1962, that I'm writing, because they both were blabbermouths. Uh, Marilyn uh, told everyone she was going to expose her relationship with the Kennedys. Well, you can't do that and not put yourself in danger. Uh, Dorothy kept saying, uh, I'm going to break this case wide open. I'm going to prove he'll, who killed the president and why. Uh, she told the hairdressers, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. She told another hairdresser, I'm afraid for my life and my family. I'm getting a gun. So we know that she knew she was uh, you know, in danger. But Dorothy Kilgallen felt like she was invincible. You have to remember how big she was at that time, how powerful. New York Post called her the most powerful female voice in America. So she thought she was invincible. I remember her as a kid. I remember seeing her on TV. But again, I was surprised at how extensive her repertorial skills were. You know, most people consider her just a TV star, a personality, a celebrity. But as you pointed out, she was really a serious, very competent reporter. Well, there's never been anybody like Dorothy as a media icon. I don't care what you say about Oprah or Diane Sawyer. Uh, when I first looked into her, her life and times, that's what I thought. What's my line? She's a game show panelist, mm -hmm. syndicated to 200 newspapers across the country with her voice, a Broadway column, radio show with her husband. Um, One million people listen to it a day in New York, oh. covered the Lindbergh baby kidnapping case. Um, the Dr. Sam Shepard case, which became the fugitive movie with Harrison Ford. Right. Uh, all of these things, plus she covered the Jack Ruby trial, the only, guy, only reporter to interview him and all of that. So she had the goods. There's no question about that. But unfortunately, I believe, and I think we know that this it, it makes sense, she shared it with Ron Pataki. And I found two relatives of Pataki's, cousins, who basically said that, yes, uh, Pataki was getting information from her about what she knew, what was going to be in the book and everything. And more than that, Larry, what really convinced me to even look more into his life is that he told those relatives he was the last person to see Dorothy Kilgallen alive. Mm -hmm. So that fits in with him being that mystery man that last night at the Hotel Regency Bar. Now, all this time, I've, I've put together a pretty darn good picture of why Ron was involved in Dorothy's death. It has to do 
with, with, to begin with, with two poems that he wrote. Uh, he basically um, wrote these two poems, and he says, of course, that they were poems that uh, were humorous and they weren't meant to be anything other than the fact that, um, you know, he, he, was, he was just writing the poems for fun. Well, let me read them to you because I think they're very important. Sure. First one was called Never Trust a, a Never Trust a Stiff at a Typewriter. There's a way to quench a gossip's stench that never fails. One cannot write if zipper tight. Somebody who's dead could tell no tales. Wow. Now you can't hear that poem without believing that it was about Dorothy Kilgallen. The second one is even more lethal and more incriminating, as I have told the New York District Attorney's Office and recently the New York City Police Commissioner. Mm -hmm. This one contains, you know, we kind of know what happened to Dorothy through my forensic evidence that basically the night of her death, one way or another, there ended up not, be, not one, but three barbiturates in her system, which proves she couldn't accidentally have died or committed suicide, that she was murdered. Well, this particular poem is incriminating because it basically gives facts that only the killer could know. And when I was a criminal defense lawyer, you know, they were always looking for information that my clients had that they couldn't have known if they weren't there. Well, listen to this one. Right. Vodka roulette seen as a relief possibility. Vodka roulette seen as a re relief possibility. While I'm spilling my guts, she's driving me nuts. Please fetch us two drinks on the run. Just skip all the noise and make one of them poison and don't even tell me which one. Now, were these secretive poems that you uncovered and we know about them? He didn't even put them on a book. He put them on his website. And I do want to talk about my interviews with him and what he had to say about those. But that really then led to, along with the other evidence against him, he was a pathological liar with regard to... When he was in New York, he said he wasn't, that he was in uh, Columbus, Ohio. When he heard about her death, we found a woman who he said was right there when that happened. And she said she was in Los Angeles, so that didn't make any sense. Lie after lie after lie. But all this time, Larry, and this, this is the most updated information. It's not in any book. It'll be in the new one. All the time, I wondered how whatever Pataki knew that Dorothy was going to write in the book, who did he tell about it? Well, as you know, uh, as an investigative reporter yourself, your tips come from the strangest places. Yeah. And this is a good story. Uh, probably at least now three years ago, my wife and I ended up in Paris. I love Paris. And we went to my favorite bookstore, Shakespeare and Company, which is where Hemingway and Joyce and all those people were. They had just written a thick book about the history of Shakespeare and Company. And I bought one. And I brought it back. And it talked about a guy named Ed, who's asked me to not reveal his, uh, his identity, but Ed, who was uh, talking about the fact that he was sent by the mafia from New York City to Las Vegas, to the Sands, to check on a uh, casino dealer or guy working on, in, the, in the crap tables to see whether he was cheating or not. Mm -hmm. And in that account, he said he went out there and he watched what was going on, and he said... Uh, I discovered the guy was cheating, okay, and he said he never cheated again, <laughs> which you can imagine happening. Yeah. So we go through this conversation, and I'm interested about the mafia and the sands and everything, and sometimes, again, people think I'm nuts, but sometimes Dorothy has just guided me along, I believe. I think she chose me to tell her story, guided me along to this new evidence, and right before he hung up, I said, just off the, offhand, do you know who Ron Pataki was? He says, well, sure. And he told me this story. Ron Pataki, he said, in the late stages of 1965, was in trouble. Now, he couldn't tell me what kind of trouble it was, but he said it was with the wrong people. And he said those wrong people found out about that and knew about his relationship with, Pataki, uh, with Dorothy. And they came to him and they said, Ron, we can get you out of your trouble. We think maybe it might have had to do with gambling debts or money problems or whatever, because Ron didn't make a lot of money, uh, wanted to be a big shot, but he didn't make a lot of money in Columbus, Ohio. So um, they come to him. And as this man, Ed, described it, it was the wrong people. 
They could have been rogue government agents. They could have been underworld characters. Whoever they were, they came to him and said, look, here's the deal. You find out what she's telling, what she's going to put in the new book for Random House, and you tell us, and we'll get you out of the trouble. I believe that that's exactly what he did, that he went to Dorothy and she basically laid out everything, what she had found uh, when she talked to Ruby, what she had found in New Orleans versus Marcello, the connection with Hoover covering up everything. She just basically laid it out. And she also, I believe, because I think the evidence proves this, had connected Marcello, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Jack Ruby, which I have done through other sources as well. For our listeners, Marcello, Carlos Marcello, the head of the... Uh... New Orleans crime syndicate? Don, New Orleans, Don, but his empire stretched to uh, New, uh, to Dallas, and one of the uh, two of the underlings there were linked to Jack Ruby. In fact, one of them was the first one to visit Jack Ruby in jail after Ruby got, uh, got arrested. Yeah. So that whole connection was there. She spills the beans to Pataki, and as this guy said, and this kind of gives me a chill whenever I say it, he said, when, it, when that happened, she was dead. And that's filled in the blanks now with regard to what's going on and what happened back then. And so with this new evidence and other things that I found, I decided uh, I had interviewed Ron Pataki, uh, I think, three times. And I would leveled with him. I sent him both of the books I'd written, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much and Denial of Justice. I was up front with him that I had accused him of murder or complicity in Dorothy's death and all of that. Uh, so I've always been up front with him regarding things. Well, today I decided I want to get back in touch with him. So I sent him an email. I have his email address. And I said, Ron, I've got new evidence about your complicity in Dorothy's death. And I'd like to talk to you about it. Please get in touch with me for an interview. Now, I haven't heard from him yet. Many people ask me, and I, I, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if I did. And here's why. The last time I talked to him, uh, we got down to the end of the conversation, and I said, Ron, you know what? I think Dorothy Kilgallen loved you. I really do. She trusted you, and she loved you, and I think you may have really loved her, too. Now, you know what happened back then. We both know, from all the evidence I've compiled and talking to you and everything, we both know you know what happened back then. Why don't you level with me and get this off of your conscience, off your back, and, and, and all of that? And Larry, there was about a minute to a minute and a half pause. And I thought he was going to tell me and confess to what happened. But then he said, I think I've talked to you enough. And he hung up. Wow. That's as close wow. as I come. And I've told both the New York District Attorney's Office and the New York Police Department that I believe if they investigate him, and I've uh, been working on that recently, if they have an investigator talk to Ron, I think he'll come clean. I think it still does weigh on his conscience as to what happened. Uh, what, what could happen to him now? I mean, he's 84 years old. If we were to go in and tell what happened, I mean, I, I really think I got a good lawyer. The lawyer probably would work out something so that he wasn't going to go to jail or anything else like that. But now the ball is back in Ron's court. You know, there's a saying with uh, the mafia that... Um... When they want to knock you off, they send a friend, somebody you trust, not an enemy. Do you think that Ron Pataki actually killed Dorothy Kigawan himself? Uh, a woman who, that I interviewed that's in both books and will be in the new one too, um, lives down in Beverly Hills, told me that she knew Ron really in, well in the 1990s. And here was her quote. I like to use primary sources, you know, who instead of my opinion, what they say, like you have, I'm sure. Yeah. She said, Mark, I don't think he would have the guts to do something like that unless he had to, if they, if they forced him to do something like that. But I agree with you. I think it could have been Marcello's soldiers, it could have been Hoover's, it could have been others to actually uh, physically commit uh, the killing of Dorothy Kilgallen. What was strange about the death scene? I know there were several questions about uh, Marilyn Monroe's death scene which we talked about previously, but with Dorothy Kilgallen, what didn't make sense? Well, um, you look for little things again, but in this particular case, they were just glaring. Now, I have been able to show here recently, and this is another piece of news that I haven't uh, explored with anyone before you. I have been, I, I always believed it was the New York Police Department's non-investigation of Dorothy's death that really caused the problem. But recently, I interviewed Dr. Michael Bodden, 
and some others uh, about the state of affairs at the New York Medical Examiner's Office in Manhattan. And I've come to find out that it was a mess. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the, uh, the uh, medical examiner who handled Dorothy's autopsy, which was completely incorrect, was a junior medical examiner, just like it was, by the way, in Marilyn's death with Noguchi. Um, and I've come to find out that I believe that the problem wasn't with the New York Police Department. It was with the medical examiner's office because basically what they did is they issued this statement about Dorothy dying. combination of ethanol and barbiturates, circumstances undetermined. And as Baden, who was part of the autopsy team, by the way, he was surprised that I knew that. His name is right on there. As Budden said to me, they should have never done that and then gone ahead, which they did, and say she died accidentally. He said, no, they didn't know what happened. That's why they circum said circumstances undetermined. But when they went ahead, Luke, and talked to the newspaper and said she died accidentally, that was the end of it. I have a quote here by uh, the, uh, by the uh, uh, detective who was involved in uh, the invest would have been involved in the investigation, see if I can find it, but no matter what, what he said was, if I had known there was any question about her death, I would have investigated it. So you, the whole thing there would have been that they would have gone back and looked at this bedroom, all right? The hairdressers would have told him she never slept there. They would have told her she never slept in that bed because she had found her husband, actually with another man at one point. Uh, she was wearing bed clothes she never wore to bed, makeup, uh, false eyelashes, and um, a, um, a hairpiece, and none of that made sense. There was a book on her lap upside down that she had already read. Her reading glasses weren't there. Basically, what they did is they saw an empty second all bottle, and they quickly decided she must have overdosed accidentally. So that's the death scene, and it made no sense at all, but that's why there wasn't in any investigation, and that's one of the reasons I'm suggesting that there needs to be now. Do you think that it was mere incompetence with the medical examiner's office, or was it uh, intentional misdirection or, uh, or, or unreasonable conclusion? Yeah, Mike Biden really backed away from my accusations about the medical examiner's office covering up Dorothy's death. We know from uh, primary sources, again, one of the toxicologists' son who was at the medical examiner's there, another toxicologist, there's two or three of them, that the medical examiner's office at that time, in their terms, was mafia controlled. It wasn't, he said, like Joe Bonanno came in every day, but we knew what was going on. We were forced to sign death certificates that, uh, that we didn't, uh, didn't believe were uh, valid. In fact, Dorothy Joe Allen's um, uh, investigation uh, failure started with her certificate of death, which is, will be in the new book. Number one, they said her name was Dorothy Kilgallen Calmer, which was her husband's name. She never used it. They misspelled Kilgallen with two L's in the front. And more than that, they had the wrong day for when she, she was born. So there was a lot of uh, things going on at medical examiner's office. And if you're, to want, if you're going to link it up, you would say that the wrong people who came to Pataki were uh, mob-oriented some way or another. Now they had to uh, cover up this whole situation when uh, she died, and the medical examiners could, cl could close the door. But the, the door opens a little bit now because uh, it wasn't the, the uh, police department problem. It was the medical examiner's office, and it's unfortunate that the police department didn't investigate that, and that's what I'm asking for now. Well, you know, I asked you in our previous uh, interview whether um, the um, district attorney and whether the New York police uh, the, the commissioner, New York City police commissioner that you went to, uh, Dermot um, Shea, sure. uh -huh. uh, you know, is he just saying, yeah, we'll investigate, or do you think he's really going to actively do something, uh, at least, you know, investigate it in a serious manner. And do they have enough leads to reopen the case? Well, the answer to your last question is certainly they do. I've given them a list of witnesses, an evidence report. They could easily spend a great deal of time talking to people who know about what happened back there. It's amazing, but many of them are alive. Now, to answer the first part of your question, I'm an internal optimist. 
What happened in New York was meant to be. I went to a function where Shea was speaking. I asked about Dorothy Kilgallen when they asked for questions. He said, uh, we look into those kind of things with the cold case squad, but let's talk about it afterwards. I went up in front. He asked me to come up there and talk to him. I did. He gave me the name of a detective in his office that I could talk to about the investigation. That said, I've sent three emails to that detective, and I've yet to hear from him. Now, am I just, are they just hoping that I will go away? Are they, uh, you know, looking into this, but they don't want to let me know? Um, I'd like to think that they're men of honor. In my last email I sent, I, thought, I, I said, look, I think we're all men of honor. I felt like I was promised that I was going to have somebody to work with with regard to this, uh, this investigation. And I'm hoping that in the next two or three days, I'll, I'll find that that's true. I've got somebody in New York that's looking into this as well in the media. They know that she's looking into it. I'm hoping that pressure will make a difference. But you know, Larry, these kinds of cases, whether it's Epstein or it's, you know, these other mysterious deaths of people, you mentioned a, a woman that died around the JFK assassination as well. Right. There's so much uh, of these cases that people are either scared to open or they're too lazy to open or that they feel, and sometimes I understand this, Dorothy Kilgallen died 50 some years ago. Marilyn Monroe died before that. Is that, you know, why is that of interest? Well, they're both victims, I believe, of a crime. They have rights, whether they were killed five days ago or, or 50 years ago. But law enforcement, uh, government agencies, uh, un unfortunately, look, look at our U.S. government. They won't even still expose all of the JFK assassination documents 50-some years after he died. There's no reason why there's any problem with national security or anything anymore. But when they, a government agency has to expose government agency, um, uh, you know, uh, problems with what they did and, and all of that, uh, they're very reluctant to do that. But again, I'm keeping my hopes up, but I'm not going to go away. So hopefully uh, they'll come through. Mark, uh, in terms of whether it was a you know, supposed suicide or uh, accidental, uh, first of all, were the prescription drugs hers? You know, were there legitimate prescriptions for her? And secondly, what did her friends think about the possibility that was that was either a suicide or an overdose? You know, did they say that Dorothy was that way? She was careless with drugs or she was suicidal? Uh, you know, what is their take on her death? As far as the prescription drugs go, she had a prescription for Secanol, not for Tulanol and not for Phenobar or uh, Nembutal, which were the other two drugs that they finally found in her uh, system three years later. So. Uh, she had no prescriptions for those and, and had never known that she, that she uh, used those drugs at all. There was no evidence she had a drug problem. There was no evidence she had an alcoholic problem at the time. None of that. And, and unfortunately, what happens many times, and, and this happened in, in, in Marilyn's um, a case too. They, they said Marilyn was on the downhill. She had drug problems. She was this. She was that. But actually, I discovered that wasn't true. She had gotten through that period of her time, of her life. She had a new deal with 20th Century Fox for a movie, four movie offers in, in uh, Italy. A lot of good things were going on in her life, except, of course, uh, for the Kennedys having dumped her, both of them, uh, Jack and, and Bobby. With Dorothy, there was no indication of any kind, and none of her uh, friends or anyone thought that she was possi could possibly have committed suicide. She was Catholic, of course, or accidentally died. I did find a, um, a woman, a primary source, who told me that actually a, a pharmacist out in the Hamptons who normally handled Dorothy's uh, prescriptions had, had said that Dorothy wasn't using any of those drugs anymore at all, uh, including Secanol and not the other two, just Secanol. But people wonder, Mark, why didn't anybody speak up for Dorothy Kilgallen? And here's the reason. She told everybody that she was going to find the truth about the JFK assassination. Well, they said to themselves, if the same people who killed JFK killed Dorothy, I'm not about to speak up. And I'll give you one great example. At the Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org, which I would really suggest people take a look at, mm -hmm. uh, or on my uh, YouTube, uh, 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 the video on uh, denial of justice that I gave in November that now has 600,000 hits, it went viral. You can see on there uh, what I talk about in terms of these people not coming forward. The two hairdressers, for instance, she had, 
Their videotaped interviews took place in 1999 and 2000. And they said in their interviews that they had never talked about it until then because they were still scared, Larry. That's wow. 50 years, almost 50 years later. So yeah. that's why nobody spoke up for Dorothy at that time. And I think if they would have, there would have been an investigation. The, you said that she wasn't using the other drugs found in her system anymore. Was she using them at Never one time? And, and were there any bottles found that corresponded to those two other drugs that were found in her system? No. And uh, a real clue, again, that came about was, uh, okay, we have 1965. They do the toxicology report, and they find secondol. But in the autopsy report, one of the first clues I had is they also listed tulanol, which is a step up dangerous wise from secondol. Okay. Now that, that was it. And they never talked about any of that in the press, just the secondol. Now we go three years later and there's a toxicologist in the ME's office uh, who later says he was threatened in all of this, who kept bodily, uh, some of the bodily fluids. I don't know what that word is for that, but there are uh, toxicologists who do that thinking that the uh, technology will get better and they can do more tests. And I have a retired sheriff who knew this guy and knew that he did this. His name was Dr. Umberger. So he goes ahead and does the test and he finds the three barbiturates, tulanol, secanol, and phenobarbital, all right, in her system that way. Well, um, he's a firm then to expose that happening because he was scared that something would happen to him as well. So they covered up the, um, you know, uh, that particular uh, aspect of her death. What I think happened is this. Uh, whoever it was, Pataki, uh, an operative of uh, whoever had the motive to have killed the Dorothy and Silencer, the Hoover people, the Marcello people, whoever it may be, that they somehow or another, either at the uh, Regency Hotel bar or when Kilgallen got home, that they uh, used these barbiturates and put them in a vodka and tonic drink. We think that Pataki could have possibly been involved in that. And the most interesting thing part about that is that they, the capsules had obviously uh, been un, undone. Uh, they opened the capsules because there was a, a remnant of uh, phenobarbital on the rim of the one glass that was found. And as another toxicologist who I respect and is still alive told me, that's really a sign of the fact that whoever did this obviously took the capsules, opened them, and put that in there when Dorothy wasn't looking because you don't accidentally commit suicide by going ahead and do that. It could be an overdose, of course, but it felt like that that was really the, as he said, that was the work of the perpetrator. Do you think that uh, Pataki was sent uh, early on. It, it, yeah, you said that she was in, he came into her life shortly after she interviewed uh, Ruby, who was covering mm -hmm. the trial. Do you think yeah. that he was a plant from the very beginning, or do you think that when the those who were out to um, contain the Kennedy investigation found out about the relationship, then they went to him? In other words, you know, was he, was, was he a plant from the beginning to see what she was doing and eventually... Uh, take care of her if she knew too much? I think that would be a stretch and I can't prove it, so I'm not going to allege that. But, uh, you, you know, he conveniently came along and got in her life, but I have a feeling it's the latter, that uh, he got in trouble and then they found out he was very close to, uh, to Kilgallen and all of that. I also want to say in his defense, okay, in Pataki's defense, I don't believe, I, I want to believe that he did not know that what he told those people about what, what Dorothy was going to put in her book, that they were going to kill her. I think he believed it would probably try to scare her some way or another. And actually, they did first. There's an episode that took place. Dorothy woke up one morning, uh, I think it was a couple weeks before she died. And the New York newspaper, we've never been able to find the photograph, but we've confirmed it was there. Her youngest son, Carrie, who she had taken to the White House with her to meet uh, JFK, and JFK made a big, um, uh, you know, fuss over him, gave him a PT-109 pin and all of that. The photo was Carrie running across Central Park, and she was livid, apparently, uh, according to her hairdresser. 
that obviously somebody was following uh, Carrie, her youngest son, who she adored. And I believe, and I think it makes com good common sense there, that that was a warning to her. Stop what you're doing yeah. because we can get to your son. But she didn't listen. She didn't listen. And as I say, I think she thought she was invincible. Well, uh, to be continued, I mean, tell us about the book when it's coming out. Well, uh, I'm going to compare for the first time, uh, and I have a sheet here of about 30, 40 uh, similarities between the, the deaths of Dorothy Kilgallen, Marilyn Monroe, and JFK. And each of them, in my opinion, in the name of the book, is collateral damage. And the reason it's called that is because it was the actions of Joseph P. Kennedy and then Bobby Kennedy, the, the, the deaths of all three of these individuals. You have to go back to the 60 election. You remember Joe Kennedy knows they're in trouble. They go to the underworld, Giancana, Marcello, Traficante, help us win the election by getting the vote in Illinois and West Virginia. If we get in the White House, we'll leave you alone. All right. And that's what they did. They helped him win the election. And then I have a witness, a very respected um, uh, journalist who was right there and told me he was right there when Joe Kennedy ordered JFK to appoint Bobby Kennedy attorney general. And of course, then Robert Kennedy went after those guys and especially Marcello, who he first deported and then uh, uh, charged with conspiracy at the end of 65 or 1963, as we get to November, Marcello is in trouble. And I think it makes perfect sense. And I've been able to confirm that he said to himself that Bobby Kennedy, I hate him. I want to kill him. But if I kill him, JFK will come after me with everything the government has. But if I kill JFK, Bobby Kennedy will be powerless. And that's exactly what happened. You can't mess around with those Guys, if you don't mind, I want to tell you just a real quick story of a personal experience. When I was a correspondent for Good Morning America and handled some of their looking into legal cases and interviewing people and things like that, they sent me to Philadelphia to interview the lawyer for a mafia don there named Angelo Bruno, who was a big okay. deal. There. And they were the mafia was trying to get into Atlantic City. I bet you're going to add something in a minute. So. Uh, I went to I went to to Philadelphia. We were surprised this guy would talk to us. I sat down just like I'm sitting with you, and he started talking about things that I couldn't believe that he was going to talk to what he said. So I took this back to to my people at Good Morning America. Uh, Sandy Hill and David Hartman were the hosts. They played that the next day, Larry, and there was a huge uproar about it and what he said in New Orleans and a few too many facts and things. So they got a hold of me before I left Philadelphia and said, Mark, do you think he'll talk to you again? And I said, well, I can try. So I called his office. And honest to goodness, this happened. A woman came on the line and I could tell there was something wrong. And I said, listen, I'd like to talk to Mr. whatever his name was. I've forgotten. And she said, well, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shaw. Maybe you don't, mo don't know. But this morning uh, they blew him up in his car. You can't mess around with those people. And Joe Kennedy was the one. Who, who got Bobby involved as attorney general because he thought that JFK could be president, then Bobby could be president, then Ted could be president, a dynasty of Kennedys. And um, um, Now, Mark, did, did Joe Kennedy uh, tell uh, the kids to weigh off, tell Robert Kennedy not to go after them, and they went against his wishes? What was the not story? Until it was late. Not until it was too late. Um, the uh, the underworld people sent somebody, and I've confirmed this, to talk to Joe as Bobby kept doing this. Okay, I've always looked at the assassination, why uh, uh, why Bobby Kennedy wasn't killed, and what instead of why JFK was, because Bobby had many more enemies. But at one particular point, they sent an emissary to Joe, and Joe said, "I'll do what I can," and Joe had a stroke, and he never was able to talk to Bobby after that about that, and Bobby was intent. You see, Bobby was the, 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 the runt of the litter, kind of. He'd never even been in a courtroom before he was the attorney general of the United States. Yeah. And he wanted to prove himself. And I'm going to get those guys. He wrote the book, The Enemy Within, yeah. and said all these terrible things about the mafia. So, uh, no, Joe couldn't stop him. And, of course, in those days, uh, Hoover would not admit that there was such a thing. 
as a mafia. <laughs> so what does that tell you? <laughs> mind boggling, but uh, he had relationships with Frank Costello. He gambled, and Costello had his markers. And Hoover was a was a bad guy. But what what happened, unfortunately, and what I've tried to fight through the years to get to the truth of the JFK assassination is everybody was brainwashed right after JFK was killed because here's Hoover out there marching along, Oswald alone, Oswald alone, Oswald alone. Even the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas is now a shrine to Lee Harvey Oswald, something that I'm, I'm working on changing. But that's what happened back then. But there was only one person who was uh, on this end when Hoover was on this end, and that was Dorothy Kilgallen. She was the only one who was standing up and saying, that doesn't make any sense. All of her columns said that, everything, and that's what put her in danger. Yeah, and you know, back in those days, uh, there, the, the big names were so respected by the general public that the you know, cognitive, cognitive dissonance where people could not imagine that our own government would be behind it, and you know, mafia players, Joe Kennedy and all that. I mean, people have become more sophisticated since then, more disillusioned with the government. But back then, it was like, you know, it, you know they bought the story. And of course, you know, they, 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 they molded the story very quickly and very well. And that's the impression that they gave the public right away, as what you know. You, what do you think happened, Larry, if I may ask you? We used to think priests, no problem. The dentist, the doctor, the lawyer, the, the right. news person, you know, Cronkite. We had all this trust in people that they were telling us the truth. Well, I don't know when that changed, but it certainly did. Well, I think it started changing with the Kennedy assassination because, you know, there were a lot of suspicions and, you know, Mark Lane and others started uh, probing it. And uh, Dr. Cyril Wecht, who I interviewed a number of times on the Kennedy assassination, both Kennedys, uh, you know, he was one of the original debunkers of the Warren Commission. So it had a cumulative effect over the years. And I think also it was accelerated after Watergate. When there was uh, yes, the presidents yes. of the United States cursing and all the dirty tricks that were coming out on tape. Uh, and that uh, was a disillusionment because until then, you know, presidents were considered so uh, austere and so dignified and, and, and so much um, full of integrity, you know, because you had Eisenhower before Kennedy and Kennedy, you know, w w was a matinee idol and the public, you know, either disregarded or didn't know much about the, the father's mafia connections. But then you get Nixon in and that accelerated the disillusionment. Of course, we've had some wild administration since then. So I think, you know, it started being um, chipped away after uh, the Kennedy assassination, suspicions about that, and then Nixon. Yeah, good, good. And I do want to say, when you mentioned the word integrity, that's Dr. Cyril Weck. He has been a great supporter of mine, given me endorsements for books. Uh, I I've, I've still uh, communicate with him, and I just have all the respect in the world for somebody like that, because you don't have to question the fact that he's telling you the truth. But right. today, we have to... And I, and I like your idea about Watergate. I do think Watergate changed an awful lot of people's... Uh, uh, opinions about hey, can we trust people and all of that? Uh, I, I think that uh, you're right on right on point with that. Yeah. Well, Mark Shaw, thank you very much for being with us once again, and I'd love to continue this because it's it's an endless uh, subject in terms of information <laughs> that's important that the public know about. Well, it is, and I'll keep fighting for justice for Dorothy. Uh, I know that uh, I'm going against the big shots, so we'll see what happens. But I got a lot of support for this. There's a 17-year-old girl in North Carolina who's writing and calling the police commissioner, and there's other people, you know, uh, who are, are are supporting me and and trying to see if we can't get an investigation. That's all I want to get because, frankly, we want to find that investigation file of Dorothy's. I think it's still out there, yeah. uh, which had all of her files and every or all of her information about the JFK assassination and. Um, I think we'll find it at some particular point. I sure hope so. There was no, never any sign of uh, all her uh, information. I guess that's what you're talking about now. I mean, what she was going to put in the book. Was there any um, uh, preliminary um, uh, versions of, of the book? Were, were, you know, were there any, um, did she produce anything for the printer? You know, was she at that point where somebody might have had the, the documents before printing? Two things. Uh, people have asked me why she didn't make a copy. Well, you couldn't go down to Kinko's and do it, so it would have been a carbon. She did show Bennett Cerf, who was one of her, uh, what's my line, uh, co-panelists, who was right. the publisher of Random House and her publisher, a chapter uh, on that last, what's my line, uh, show. Okay. 
So that, that did happen. Uh, but as far as uh, the information about uh, what happened to her files, her books, that uh, she was writing, uh, any of her uh, information that she had, uh, I found the uh, uh, daughter of the butler, uh, Dorothy's butler, James Clement. The daughter is uh, a woman named Jordan in New York City. And uh, she told me that her father said that on the day of Dorothy's death, that FBI agents swarmed the Kilgallen townhouse, uh, the apartment there, and confiscated all of the books and documents and everything else. Yeah. I don't have any reason to believe that that didn't happen. And that's why I believe that it still could be out there. And that's what I've said to the New York Police Commissioner. Let, let's find that. Maybe it's in your files at the N NYPD. Maybe it's in the, NY, in the FBI files. Let's find that file, uh, you know, sooner than later. Did Bennett Cerf ever divulge what was in that last chapter? No, uh, they actually published a book of Dorothy's, uh, Murder One, about three years later, uh, which was approved by her husband. But uh, there was only a little bit of material in there uh, that she had uh, shown to um, Bennett Cerf, and it didn't really amount to anything that, that made any difference. I think that whatever happened to that chapter, she took it home, and it never saw the light of day. Murder One is an excellent book, and it shows Dorothy's incredible wor wordsmith skills, but it's basically a, uh, you know, a, a collection of the articles she did about the famous trials that she covered. So thus far, there has never been any exposure of what she was going to write in that book. No. Well, Mark Shaw, thanks again for the great work you're doing. I mean, this is important information that Thank is you. irrelevant to the time that has passed because it has to do with you know, what's behind the scenes of our democracy. You know, you know who's really pulling the strings. Who you know, which which power brokers are deciding things, hiding things from the public. So it's more than just a fifty-year-old case. It has to do with the the mechanisms that control our lives. Well, there's a lot of questions that you can ask about the JFK assassination that people, I hope, will ask about what's happening today. Uh, we need to ask questions. We need to uh, help hold people responsible for what they're doing. Uh, that's one of the things that doesn't seem to happen anymore, but it, it's history. And there's been so many distortions of history over the years. Little by little, we peel away the onion with some of that, but we need to do that with JFK's assassination. Uh, we need to know what happened back there. And Dorothy Kilgallen is the most credible reporter uh, who covered the JFK assassinations. She's different than anybody who ever wrote about them, including me, because she was there. Mm -hmm. And so it's firsthand accounts of what happened. Again, the Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org. You can read all of her columns. You can hear the interviews with her with Joe Tonahill, who talks about that was Jack Ruby's co-counsel, who talks about her interview with Jack Ruby. They're all primary sources and all of that is history. So I hope people will take a look at it. If you got a few more minutes, Melvin Belli, who you worked with uh, back, what, in the 80s, you said, or the, uh, yes. earlier than that, uh, was he was he sent in? as Ruby's lawyer to fix the case and get a conviction? Or was he actually operating with um, integrity? Dorothy Kilgallen thought this was a mob hit from start to finish. She really believed that uh, Marcello orchestrated this and with Ruby and, and uh, Oswald part of it. And then, you know, Oswald was captured. And so you bring in Ruby to kill him. And then she believed that uh, you know, Belli could have come along. One real clue there is another uh, comment that was made to me by a friend. Uh, his name was Kelly, I believe, as I remember. He met with, he was with Belli when a waiter walked up to the table in San Francisco and said, well, boy, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald just got shot. And this man said to me, and he, I don't believe he had any reason to lie, that Belli said to him, well, shit, now I'll have to represent Ruby. And if you look at Ruby's uh, defense, it was basically one, to show he was crazy, and two, never let him testify. And that's exactly what happened. I exposed the Ruby trial transcripts in the uh, book Denial of Justice. I, think yeah. I told you about that. The actions of Jack Ruby, you know, I got into the basement making like a reporter. The Dallas police helped me. I will be there when uh, Oswald's going to be transferred. Watching the assassination uh, in Daily Plaza from the Dallas Morning News offices, he had to be involved. We have all the connections between Marcello, 
um, uh, Ruby and Oswald in New Orleans. And so it really is what Dorothy was talking about. You can just put the dominoes together and they fall because it makes an awful lot of common sense when you look at motive that uh, Carlos Marcello, Giancana, all those guys who hated Bobby Kennedy and, and he was going to continue to pursue all of them. He wasn't smart enough to stop, even though his dad was going to tell him to, to quit. And he kept going after those guys and he was going to continue to go after them. And you just can't do that with those dangerous men. Um, I, in fact, I interviewed somebody today who told me of another little link there that somebody overheard a conversation with Sam Giancana, who was in Salt Lake City at the, on the day that Kennedy was, that died and, and was assassinated. And there was a phone conversation, person to person from Dallas. And whoever it was, they overheard it, it said to Marcello, it's done. And Mar uh, uh, said to Giancana, it's done. And Giancana said, good. So it, it just common sense. I mean, back then, that makes an awful lot of more sense than all of these crazy theories out there. I respect everybody's opinion. But Dorothy knew what happened. She was there, and she was right there in the front row at the Ruby trial. And, and that's why I think, you know, hopefully people are paying more attention to her. We have no idea why there's 606,000 views of my presentation on denial of justice in Dallas, but that happened over the last two weeks, and I got all of these emails from around the world, some tips and things like that. But some way or another, little by little, hopefully people are getting educated about what happened back there. You know, they can disagree with me, but Dorothy is the one that they hopefully will listen to. Now, the interviews that she did with Ruby, were those ever printed or were those uh, disappeared? Well, we have a couple of theories about that. Uh, we know if you listen to Joe Tonahill, he set it up. Uh, the way it happened, Larry, is interesting. Uh, Dorothy came to everybody, 400 reporters. Everybody wanted to interview Ruby at the trial. Nobody was given that access. She came to him and she said, I have a message for Jack from an opera singer in San Francisco who knows him. She came to Tonahill and told him that. Tonahill told Ruby. Ruby was enchanted with Kilgallen anyway because of her fame, and he agreed to talk to her. Conahill describes uh, that they talked just beyond the railing between the uh, defense and prosecution council tables and the uh, spectators, that they sat there for eight to ten minutes, and then the next day she had another five minutes with him. Now, she took her notes. We've seen a file of hers that those notes would have gone into. But one of two things could have happened. First of all, she kept those because she was going to use those in her uh, in her book, and she didn't want to expose them at that particular point. We think that's what happened. But more than that, she kept the notes with her and didn't expose them because she didn't want anybody to know where she went. And where was the first place she went after the Ruby trial? New Orleans. And on the DorothyKilgallenStory.org, you will hear her hairdresser, who went with her, tell, talk about a very dangerous thing that happened. They were both there. He was going to fix her hair. She went to see whoever she was going to see, and she called him at the hotel and said, you go back to New York City, and you don't tell anybody you were here, and you don't answer any questions at all. And two weeks later, she was dead.